Uh, I've been told that uh, it's a bad taste to start a TED Talk by introducing oneself. And yet, uh, my name is Andris Admenis, and there is something weird with it. Firstly, uh, Google doesn't let me register an account with such a name. I tried several times, and they just wouldn't allow it. And I guess the reason is that part of my last name consists of the English word admin. So probably it's just for safety, so that I don't start scamming people as if I was one of the administrators of Google. But uh, there's something else. Admin is, is a Latvian word uh, meaning uh, tanner. And tanner is a person that works with uh, animal skins. So probably one of my great, 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 great grandfathers was a tanner, and that's how I got this surname. A while ago, I found a book about forgotten crafts, and there was a, a chapter about tanners. So of course, I was intrigued to read it. And what struck me there was a, a tip from a professional tanner who said that if you want to make a high-quality leather bag, you should buy skins from meat cows, from the beef cows. And you should never buy skins from milk cows, from dairy cows, because they have been pregnant several times, their skin is stretched, not as flexible anymore, so it's not good quality. So that's a quite practical tip, right? But for me, it was rather awkward. And why so? Because you are not very likely to find me buying somebody's skin or taking somebody's skin, you're much more likely seeing me advocating against killing animals. Here I'm in a silent protest about fur farming, interviewing people at a circus protest uh, against exploiting animals in circus. I'm also doing a radio show about animal rights and veganism and science discoveries. And I enjoy doing school talks for kids. And uh, here are some Latvian activists bringing a petition to ban fur farming to the parliament. Coming back to my last name, Tanner, I guess if there was such a thing as an intergenerational karma, I might be the living proof of it. And yeah, in, in those years, basically for 10 years, I've been involved in animal advocacy and working with people who know a lot about animals. And in this time, one of the main things I've noticed is that our understanding about them is incomplete and superficial, even wrong. And even in cases when we consider them, the animals, the focus tends to be on the benefit for humans, right? Because humans are the most significant entities in the universe. Everything is regarded in terms of human values and human experiences. But is such an exclusively human-centered perspective justified? Did you know that uh, sheep can remember many, many faces? Uh, or that apes can remember hundreds of hand signs and communicate with them? Or uh, did you know that pigs are so similar to us that their internal organs could be used like for donation, for uh, transplants. Speaking of pigs, all pigs are equal, but some pigs are much more equal. <laughs> and what I mean by that is that, depending on the context, they are treated very differently by humans. Have you heard about Esther, the wonder pig? Because you should, she's the most famous pig in the world at the moment. She even has her own TED talk. She was adopted as a mini pig. So the family took her in, thinking that she will grow to the size of a cat. But they were wrong. <laughs> and now she's huge, and she weighs more than the rest of her family together. And what, what would you do with a family member that keeps on growing? I hope it's not selling them. <laughs> And yeah, you make more space for it, or, or should I say for, for her. She is a part of that family, just like that cat and that dog is. They eat together, play together, sleep together, they have distinct personalities. And is there a morally relevant difference between the cat and the pig, or the dog and the pig? And if not, 
why should pigs be treated worse than they? Isn't it a form of racism? I mean, speciesism? But unfortunately, this is not a typical life story of a pig. This is a typical modern farm where the typical pigs spend their typical lives uh, without enjoying sunshine or grass under their feet, never digging for tasty roots, or never rolling in the mud. And to me, the mind-itching question is, why? Why do we treat animals, some animals, as individuals and even as our friends, while at the same time, others we treat as replaceable units and even things? What, what do you see in this picture? It's lots of pigs, right? A su successful business. But what if you knew that one of them was Esther, a curious being that once lived in a family, was close friends with the dog Reuben and cat Finnegan. Would you perceive this photo in the same way? And what I'm saying is that seeing or imagining animals or humans as part of a faceless crowd, it makes it easy to normalize all kinds of bad things, atrocities done to them things that we wouldn't accept otherwise. We could also eliminate all the traces that lead us to perceive them as individuals. No face, no name, no skin, no context at all, just a product with a date of expiration and a price. It makes it easy, right? When I was in high school, I was staying with my grandma, and one night I was really hungry. I went to the fridge, there was a piece of bacon, I cut a slice of it, enjoyed it, and wanted to have some more, but then I noticed that there was a nipple on it, just like in this photo. Can you eat something that has a nipple? <laughs> I managed to swallow that bite that I already had, but that was a life-transforming experience. So, the way we treat animals, it depends on how we see them and what we know about them. And over time, also, humanity has changed its perception on animals. For example, I still can't believe that the superstar of Western philosophy, one of the brightest minds, René Descartes, once argued that animals are merely biological machines, not thinking, not being conscious, not even feeling or Aristotle, the ancient Greek philosopher. He saw nature organized in a clear hierarchy, humans being as the most perfect ones on top, then mammals far below, birds, reptiles, and so on, and each of the levels on the lower side were supposedly meant for the upper levels. And by the way, according to Aristotle, he thought that also women were below men and at least a little higher than slaves, who are also a natural part of the world, at least in his times. And, and biblical view was pretty similar. Man was given the... God, God's given the right to rule over everything else, everyone else. And it's only since Charles Darwin published his influential book on the origin of species, only since then we are starting to accept our connection with other beings, other species. So, modern biology doesn't see nature as a simple hierarchy as Aristotle or Bible did. To the contrary, it's a rather... A, it's organized in an incredibly complex way, but still a unified way. And even illustrations like this one, made by the Tree of Life web project is a simplification of the complexity of Earthlings, the family network of life forms on our planet. Almost every day, scientists uncover new data on animals, and there is an awkward amount of new knowledge. And in recent century alone, we have developed so many things, technology that helps us understand them better, the animals, both for scientists and for us. Uh, we have been learning about life underwater, deep in the oceans. 
millions of people recently watched a live stream video about giraffe baby being born. I imagine that at least some of you in this audience enjoy spying on birds via video streams from their nests. These videos are very popular in Latvia. And we have also learned that there were many other humanoids, not just Homo sapiens. And genetics as a science is opening our eyes about the relatedness on a stunning micro level. So, inevitably, new data and discoveries are pushing us to rethink the, our place in the universe and also our relation to other animals. And it's a part of an already existing trend of dethroning ourselves, decroning ourselves, and getting rid of the sweet illusion of being the center of everything. Major scientific breakthroughs again and again have pushed us to humble self perception. Like, once we believe that we are created, uh, our planet is the center of the universe, and now we know we aren't. Uh, we thought that at least we are in the center of the solar system and everything is circling around us, but that's also not true. And also, there was no doubt that we are fundamentally different from those beasts, that we are rather godlike creatures, right? But now there's more and more evidence that hum Homo sapiens, humans, are just one of the many species sharing all kinds of traits and uh, capabilities that we value highly, also with the uh, other animals who have those too. And humanity has already started to take this message on board. Animals are more and more taking the space in our imagination, in the political agenda, in environmental awareness. The animal protection standards are higher than ever. There are more and more alternatives for animal products, and their well-being is mentioned even in the credits of movies and on the shampoo bottles. So, in other words, animals are entering the human-centered world in unprecedented ways. But uh, where do we go from here? Should we envision times when the golden rule of ethics uh, to treat others as you would wish to be treated uh, applies just, not just to humans, but also to at least some other species? We might even go much further, envisioning times when the wolf and the lamb would peacefully dwell together, like in the biblical scene of paradise. Our imagination is boundless, and it can bring us quite far. Did you know that once, at least once, uh, humans even tried animals in court? In 1457, a pig and her piglets were accused of a murder of a child. The mother pig was found guilty, but uh, her baby is innocent. It really happened, a serious court case. Or consider the story sometimes told to children, especially when they ask too many questions about our treatment to animals. So they are told that in exchange for food, safety and shelter, the cows agreed to give us their milk, uh, chickens agreed to give us their eggs, and pigs agreed to give us their flesh and their babies, right? And so on. And even as adults, we keep saying sometimes that animals are giving us all those things, although it's clear that we are the ones who make those choices. So surely, this story should be in the same book of historic curiosities uh, as the story about pig in a court. But on the other hand, we have also been historically really successful in denying animal emotions, animal sentience, uh, mental skills. So we need to find a balance between those extremes with the best new evidence we, that we have. And of course, there will be serious dilemmas. Like, suppose that a driverless car uh, is programmed to estimate various uh, uh, risks of collisions. It is driving, and suddenly a piglet is crossing the road. So what should the car's programming be in such a case? Should it try not to hit the piglet at any cost, even to the humans in the car? Or should it run over the piglet only as a last resort to save humans? Or should this piglet be sacrificed even in, if the car is empty to avoid the damage costs? What is the value of a pig's life? Actually, such decisions are made every day already now. Because it's not animals who make those choices and decisions, it's us. It's not 
them who rule the world, we kind of do. And we decide which animals exist and in what uh, conditions. So I guess with such great power also comes great responsibility. I believe in humanity. I believe in humankind, in human kindness. I believe that we can exercise this great power that we have in an intelligent and kind way. Otherwise, I wouldn't come and stand up here. <laughs> and many animal-related issues are already becoming less and less controversial. They are based upon the simple value of kindness, the simple idea of not harming unnecessarily. And I see humankind already mobilizing. Like, we know that we will not die of cold just because we're not wearing fur coats. So the fur farms are slowly closing down. We found ways to make safe cosmetics, so there's no need to test them on animals. We learned that uh, we can enjoy circus shows without exploiting and caging animals. So the circus is changing right in front of our eyes, right? But still, there is a huge problem, the biggest problem, the elephant in the room, or should we say, the pig in the room. Why are we still treating animals, cows, pigs, chickens, and so many others, as if they were not individuals, but things for consumption? They are sentient beings who can feel joy, feel fear, pain, and many other things. So if we know all that, why are we still sticking forks in their bodies? Is it still a matter of survival for us in the 21st century? I think there are already ways that to live well with nothing taken away from animals. And in less than 100 years, eating animals might be just as unimaginable as cannibalism or slavery or witch burning is right now. And even today, I believe that if humanity, each one of us, would notice and accept that an, each animal is a someone, not a something, we would stop making excuses. And knowing how kindly many of us treat the cats and the dogs, it's obvious that we already have it inside of us. So let's allow kindness, this essence of being a human, to guide us. Let's embrace it fully without discriminating the dogs, cats, pigs, cows. Kindness will lead us away from causing suffering, suffering and causing pain and harm, and not just to humans, but also to other animals. Thank you.